13.8 billion years ago, a mysterious explosion happened in space. It was chaos, a time when the stars, planets, asteroids, the rest of the space bodies, and galaxies were born. It was the Big Bang, a theory we all know about. But no one knows for sure what happened, where the universe came from, and what was there before. Some even think the universe went through a cycle where it contracted and expanded several times. In 1991, a cosmologist from Stanford University named Andre Linde had submitted an article with the main idea that there was a possibility the universe had been created in a laboratory. His theory said there was a chance an advanced civilization somewhere out there had created our universe. This civilization has made an entirely new cosmos that later evolved its own planets, stars, and intelligent forms of life. 30 years later, many scientists take this theory pretty seriously. They even started talking about things that we, as a civilization, can do to get to such an advanced level. The theory says this advanced civilization decided to add technology that helped to create a new universe out of nothing. It happened through quantum tunneling. It's when an atom can appear on the opposite side of some barrier, even though it's supposed to be impossible, considering the laws of physics of our world. Like if you wanted to pass a tall wall, but you can't pass it with ladders or go around somewhere. Imagine you can just walk through it like a ghost. In our world, it's not possible, but a more advanced civilization perhaps can do it. Plus, they realized how they could create new universes. Right now, on the cosmic scale, we could be a Class C civilization. We don't know how to recreate some things. For example, conditions on the Earth for when our central star, the Sun, goes out. If we manage to become a Class B civilization, we'll learn to adjust conditions to be independent of the Sun. That means we might be able to learn how to live even without it. And if we level up and become Class A, we'll know how to recreate cosmic conditions and produce our own cosmos in our laboratories. We think of the world we live in through three dimensions of space, east-west, north-south, and up-down. There's also one dimension of time, which means we can distinguish past from future. A fifth dimension would represent one more extra dimension of space. The theory of its existence was first mentioned in the 1920s. It was inspired by the theory of gravity by Albert Einstein, who said space-time is warped by matter and energy. We can't perceive these four dimensions, but we see how an object moves and attribute it to gravity. And maybe there's some other force, like the electromagnetic force, that's more than 1,000 times stronger than gravity that could explain things going on in that extra dimension of space. The fifth dimension is curved in a way we can't see it, but the idea about it was mentioned in a string theory. It considers the universe as really small strings of mass energy, not as particles. They vibrate in 10-dimensional space-time, considering six dimensions are rolled up way smaller than a single atom. That led to the picture of the universe as a 3D island that floats in 10-dimensional space-time. Also, the fifth dimension might be an excellent explanation to tell us more about dark matter. That's the invisible stuff with a mass, but we can't see it, nor can it interact with ordinary matter. And dark matter is 85% of all the matter in our universe. The universe can't be still. It's constantly in motion, either contracting or expanding. We used to think there were 100 billion galaxies, but it turns out there are more than a trillion. The galaxies are moving away from each other. This is what it means when scientists say the universe is expanding all the time. There are voids between galaxies that sometimes stretch millions and millions of light years across. They can seem empty, but they can also contain way more matter than we can find in galaxies. Still, stars usually can't be formed there because the matter between those areas has lower density. But there's still plenty of so-called intergalactic stars. A good example is the Virgo galaxy cluster, 10% of which are intergalactic stars. We don't know how exactly they got there, but there are two possible ways. One. Stars can collide, merge, or pass close to another galaxy, which can kick it off from its parent galaxy. Option number two, a supermassive black hole can accelerate a star to very high velocities if they have a close encounter, which can, again, make a star be expelled from its parent galaxy. 
If you could have a giant magnet, you could even pull something out from the vicinity of a black hole. That's possible if the magnetic field near a supermassive black hole is as strong as the black hole's gravitational field. But it doesn't work if we're talking about material that's already beyond the black hole's event horizon. That's a spot with a gravitational force so powerful, not even light can get away. You'd need to accelerate this material to the speed of light, at least, to get away. For that, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. But a magnet could help if something's heading toward the black hole but didn't get inside yet. When someone mentions a black hole, you might get a picture of some giant void in space. But the Milky Way is most likely full of thousands of smaller black holes that float around the galaxy. When a star comes to its end, it will destroy itself in a supernova explosion, which is a cataclysm of energy. In that explosion, the densities in the core will reach an intense enough state that nothing will be able to escape. At the same time, the major part of the star explodes outward, but a part of it collapses inward, creating a black hole. The bigger the star, the bigger the hole. The black hole then swallows everything that comes in its way, including other stars as well. When a star gets sucked up into the black hole, it's ripped apart because of the strong gravity inside the black hole. Some of its parts fall into the black hole, while others get ejected at incredibly high speeds. Some black holes might have been formed in a different way. The early stages of our universe were, to say the least, pretty chaotic. It had high temperatures and pressures, and was in a state that shaped the entire cosmos. Under the right conditions, any old gas patch may have shrunk itself to become a black hole. And they came in many different sizes, from something that weighs a couple of pounds to giant masses like thousands of suns and those in between. They aren't really black. Black holes are areas with strong gravity, and no object can escape when it gets inside. They feed off electromagnetic radiation, such as light and space particles. Since they're consuming matter all the time, black holes give off a dark glow. The Earth is not that close to the inhospitable edge of the solar system. We're the sixth planet from it. Scientists made a pretty cool 3D map of our solar system, where we can see what the edge looks like. It took them 13 years to design it. The boundary is called the outer heliosphere. It marks the area in space where the solar wind, which is the stream of charged particles our sun emits, gets deflected and draped back by the radiation coming from the empty region beyond our solar system. The inner layer of the heliosphere is where the sun and the planets have a rough shape of a sphere, while the outer layer is not that symmetrical. This asymmetry happens because our sun is moving through the galaxy and goes through friction with the radiation in front of it. Now, when we say the word universe, we're already picturing this vast space filled with stars, planets, and comets. Truth is, most of us find it hard to actually picture how large the universe is. Well, try to think of space as the biggest playground you've ever seen. Right now, our space playground goes on for 46 billion light years. It wasn't always like that. On that note, you've surely heard of the Big Bang Theory. Let's try to unpack it. Imagine the whole wide universe, every star, planet, down to the smallest particle, squished into a tiny, super-hot ball the size of, let's say, an apple. From that point on, we've got a pretty neat roadmap of how things unfolded in the cosmos. Dive even deeper into the universe's past, and things start to get a bit blurry. The energies and temperatures rise, and suddenly, our rulebook of physics doesn't make sense anymore. When we reach these early times, gravity, that force that keeps our feet on the ground, starts acting all mysterious. This is where we bump into the great puzzle of our time, quantum gravity. And here's the honest truth, we've still got some homework to do on that one. What made the Big Bang go pop in the first place? Well, it's kind of like asking what happened before the first page of a book. There's no page zero, or at least that's the answer that quantum physics provides. It tells us that there are events in the universe that just, you know, happen. It's not because we're not looking where we should, it's just how the universe works. Or at least, that's our current understanding of it. Right after the blast, everything was just a bubbly mix of gas, like this soda can that just got opened. This gas, which was mainly helium and hydrogen, began to stretch out and cool down. 
If we could time travel to those times, we'd see a younger, hotter, and cozier universe. Cool telescopes like the Hubble and James Webb let us peek into those ancient times. And what we see is fascinating. Earlier galaxies were like the cute photos of the universe when it was younger. Tinier, less heavy, and not as evolved as they are now. Over billions of years, the universe stretched out like a soap bubble. Imagine countless shiny marbles inside it, representing stars and galaxies. As the bubble grew bigger, the marbles spread out. Today, inside our bubble, we have trillions of galaxies. For every single galaxy we can spot, there are tons more we haven't seen yet. Some are too tiny, others are too far away. We still can't see them even if we use the fanciest telescopes available. Just to paint you a better picture, know that today our very own Milky Way is home to around 400 billion stars, similar to the Sun. It was a lot different in the past, though. Our galaxy began its journey like a little bundle of stuff, just a tad denser than most things in space. A lot of it was actually made of dark matter. Our closest star friend, named Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light-years away. To put that in earthly terms, that's like taking a road trip around our planet millions of times. It's also about the same age as the Sun. If we could have looked at the exact spot about 5 billion years ago, it wouldn't have been there at all. Many stars live together in groups, kind of like families. However, most are solo adventurers, experiencing the vastness on their own. When you zoom out from our Milky Way and peek into the larger universe, it's more, well, empty. Like a vast piece of countryside between big cities. In our cosmic area, we've got some cool neighbors. The Andromeda Galaxy, for instance, is just a stroll away, in cosmic terms, at 2.5 million light-years. And there are lots of smaller galaxies too, like the Triangulum Galaxy and the Large Magellanic Cloud. Our local hangout spot, which includes all these galaxies, spans about 3 million light-years. As we explore further, galaxies seem to gather in clusters, like suburbs. Connecting these clusters are threads of galaxies, creating a giant web in the universe. Galaxies are clustered this way because, just like magnets, they love to pull stuff towards them. If we could turn back time, we'd see a different picture. That's because throughout history, the popular galaxies with lots of stuff became even bigger, while the less popular ones gave their items away. From Earth, we can only see objects that are 46 billion light-years away at the most. If we put all this space into a giant box, its volume would be unimaginably huge. The main reason our universe is such a grand spectacle today is that it's been growing nonstop. Every year, its size increases a little more. In fact, the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. Sure, we can't feel it down here on Earth, but there are clear signs in the universe that it's happening. We're still not sure why the universe behaves like that, but scientists are working hard to figure out this mysterious expansion. Our understanding of the universe has changed a lot over the years, too. Back in the day, when our world had more trees than buildings, people from all corners of the Earth would gaze up at a twinkling sky above. For many, this sky was their roadmap, alarm clock, and spiritual connection point. Now, imagine not having a smartphone or a compass and still being able to find your way home or knowing when to plant your crops. That's because our ancestors had the sky. They knew when it was time to take care of plants, navigate ships, or celebrate special occasions all by watching the stars and planets. Long ago, people in Babylon spotted some stars that behaved a little weirdly. These stars seemed to have a mind of their own. Obviously, we know now that they weren't stars at all. They were planets, like Venus and Mars, that sometimes wink at us down here. There was also a time when we believed the Earth was flat. Well, at least some people did, before Greeks in the 6th century BCE figured out that it's round. They even managed to guess its size by watching shadows in different places. They were pretty close with their estimations, especially if you take into consideration their limited tools. Now, speaking of our planet, there was also a time when humankind believed the Earth to be the center of the universe. We also believed everything else was just spinning around it. 
That was until a man named Copernicus did a bit of research and figured out it was actually the Sun coordinating all the movement in our system. And soon after, other thinkers and stargazers joined in on the fun, changing how we perceive the universe using new tools. Speaking of tools, thanks to a telescope, Galileo found out that Jupiter had massive moons tagging along. We call them the Galilean moons today in his honor. But the universe kept tossing surprises our way. Some people started cataloging stars, clusters, and nebula, while others found mysterious rays that our eyes can't see. And just when we thought we had it all figured out, Edwin Hubble, not the telescope but the man behind the name, discovered something amazing too. He realized that other galaxies are in fact moving further away from us. These days, we're looking at the universe in a different way. We know how the timeline works now. We know that our time here on Earth is limited. No wonder astronomers are eagerly scouting through the vastness of space, looking for planets similar to ours. There is no other planet that can safely accommodate us in our solar system. But we can use our neighboring planets and satellites for scientific purposes. Take Mars, for instance. In the following decades, NASA is planning to send all sorts of devices and even people up there. If the experiment proves to be successful, we might end up living there for a while, or at least use it as a pit stop for our next exciting destination. Now we all know that all planets are round. There are no square ones so far, and that's because of gravity. Well, roundish at least, as not all of the planets have perfect proportions. But did you ever wonder about the shape of the universe itself? Is it also round because of the same forces? Well, not really. Based on what information we have so far, the universe is actually… flat? According to the principles of general relativity, space has the ability to curve. This opens the door for the universe to have three potential shapes – a flat plane like a sheet of paper, a closed sphere like a bowl, or an open saddle-like curve. This isn't just a matter of academic interest, you know. The universe's shape has direct consequences on its ultimate destiny. One cosmologist from Princeton University explained it beautifully. The shape of the universe is a kind of map to its past and a predictor of its future. The questions of whether the universe will keep expanding forever or collapse at some point, and if it's finite or infinite, all circle back to the question of its shape. Now to wrap your head around this cosmic question, you need to understand two key elements – the density of the universe and its rate of expansion. Let's dig into this a little. Around 68% of the universe is made up of dark energy, while 27% is dark matter. <laughs> the rest, which is normal matter, if you'd like, makes up the stars, planets, and other cosmic bodies we're familiar with. When we talk about the density of the universe, we're referring to the quantity of normal matter packed into a given volume of space. Now, if the universe is denser, it also has more gravity. In this case, the gravitational pull can overcome the force of expansion, so the universe curls up into a sphere. This shape is known as the closed model, where the universe ends up looking like a gigantic cosmic ball. Imagine a world that's finite but without boundaries – a contradiction for sure. In this model, an adventurous explorer could travel forever through space, never bumping into a wall or falling over an edge. Alternatively, if the density of the universe is low and not enough to halt the expansion, then space distorts in the opposite direction. This results in an open universe with negative curvature that resembles a saddle. You know, like on a horse. Despite these two potential scenarios, most scientists agree that the density of the universe is just right. Which means it expands proportionally without curving. But what does it mean if the universe is flat? It doesn't mean we're living in an infinite sheet of paper. To understand it, consider these analogies. Imagine you're in a square room, walk 10 steps to the next corner, make a 90-degree turn, walk another 10 steps, and repeat this process twice more. You end up back at your starting point, completing a square. 
Add another dimension to this geometry, since we're not 2D creatures, and whoopee, you have a flat universe. This analogy wouldn't hold up in a curved space. If you have a terrestrial globe at home, you might find it easier to understand this next experiment. Start by placing your finger at the Earth's equator, then trace a line to the North Pole, make a 90-degree turn, and return to the equator. Make one more 90-degree turn and walk back to your starting point. This journey only needed three turns, unlike the four turns in the flat universe scenario. Still struggling to understand? Here's another way to picture it. In a flat universe, two rockets traveling side by side will always remain parallel. This is in contrast to a closed universe, where the rockets will travel along the curve of space and eventually meet where they started. In an open universe with negative curvature, the rockets will gradually drift apart and never cross paths again. So is there a cosmological crisis at hand? It seems the answer to the shape of our universe is encoded in the cosmic microwave background, also named CMB, which is like the universe's fossil record. Over the past few decades, scientists have measured temperature fluctuations in the CMB to find almost no curvature, indicating a flat universe. Now, the concept of a flat universe is crucial to the standard cosmological model. However, in late 2019, scientists from a university in Rome published a paper arguing that current CMB measurements actually indicate we're really living in a closed universe. How did they figure this out? Well, they looked at how light behaves in the universe. Specifically, they analyzed how light bends because of the gravitational force of matter in its path. Either way, apart from this finding, there's nothing else that would suggest we're living in a closed universe. Most scientists believe this recent discovery is nothing more than a statistical anomaly. But if the closed universe theory turns out to be right, it would shift decades of astronomical findings. If the universe is indeed curved, it must be so large that the observable 93 billion light years aren't enough to reveal its curvature. It could be similar to standing in a fog, only able to see a small, flat patch of land. Yet somewhere out of sight, the horizon reveals that we live on a sphere. As we continue to probe the cosmos, we might find that the apparent flatness of our universe is just a small part of a much larger, curved cosmos. Its shape is just one of the many things we've yet to figure out about the universe. We can't quite put our finger on why the universe is even here, for instance. We do have some theories, but scientists are yet to be sure. It could be that the universe is like a pop-up, materializing out of an unstable nowhere land. Imagine the emptiest emptiness you can think of, suddenly churning out matter and energy in equal and opposite amounts that tally up to zero. For most of us, it's hard to picture that process. If we follow this theory, who's to say there's only one universe? We might be just one of an enormous collection, a so-called multiverse. For now, we'll just have to wait for the next wave of cosmic measurements to refine our theories. And for scientists to come up with hypotheses that aren't just mathematically pretty, but actually testable. Also. How could we possibly know all the secrets of the universe if we don't completely understand our own biology yet? I mean, if we did, we could, theoretically, solve all of our health problems, right? We might even be able to play around with our DNA, like this molecular Lego, and give ourselves naturally purple hair or red fingernails. Well, time for a reality check, as we're still struggling with this one, too. Here's a great example, our microbiome. Our bodies, home to 10 trillion human cells, are also an active city for 100 trillion microbial cells. That's a couple of pounds of bacteria and other microbes, which we absolutely can't do without. They've set up shop in our bellies, lungs, noses, and every other hidden nook and cranny. We're like luxurious cruise ships for these tiny microbial tourists, and we still don't fully understand the implications of this symbiotic relationship. There are still a lot of things we don't know about planet Earth, either. We've only ever dipped our toes into Earth's crust 
never venturing more than a few miles deep. Everything else is our best guess, from remote sensing and smart physics. Believe it or not, it took us an embarrassingly long time to accept that the Earth's crust is constantly shifting like Jenga pieces. We only warmed up to plate tectonics in the mid-20th century. We're also still trying to figure out precisely how the planet's inner engine works, and how the swirling conducting materials in the outer core create our protective magnetic field. Plus, with 4.5 billion years of geological chaos, we're sometimes better off studying meteorites or the surfaces of other celestial bodies for clues about our planet's history. Even our faithful companion, the Moon, is a bit of a mystery. Was it born from a colossal collision or some other event? We're still not sure. But hey, the fact that we still have a lot to learn is what makes life interesting, isn't it? That, and the thrill of actually finding an empty parking spot in San Francisco. Or maybe even your city.